All right. That's true. It's, it's two o'clock. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So for all of you out there who are interested in spending an hour talking about juicy historical tidbits and details and how much fun all of that is, you are in the right place as we talk about mining the past. My name is Christine Trent. I am the author of the Lady of Ashes historical mystery series about a, a lady Victorian undertaker, as well as uh, the Florence Nightingale mysteries. And I also have some other uh, historical novels. And uh, we, I see we have our fourth, um, our third panel, uh, our other panelist uh, now coming in. So I'm really happy uh, to see that. Yay! <laughs> so. I do want to encourage you as the alley is coming in, if you have any questions that you want to ask uh, individual panelists or that you want to ask everybody at large, please, please, please put them in the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that. I'm going to try to monitor chat as well, but it's going to be harder for me to see your questions in there since there's running dialogue in there. So it really is better if you can click the Q&A button and put your questions there uh, and Everybody's really excited to hear from you, and we want to know what your questions are, so please don't hesitate to do that. All right. Can so, I do a quick check? Can you hear me okay? Allie, mm -hmm. we can hear you, and I hope that we will see you soon. But we Okay, because I, I was going to say, I don't see me. We don't, yes. You are, you are sort of our invisible, <laughs> you're our paranormal attendee today. I'm the ghost writer. You are. You are the ghost writer today. <laughs> All right. So... I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our authors. Um, first of all, we have Eleanor Coons, and uh, we're going to be talking about her book, Death in the Great Dismal, today. A uh, very, uh, very interesting book. It's um, got setting as a, as a character, is all I can say, the, the, that um, the setting really adds to it. It's very spooky and ethereal, and it's a really neat book. And we've also got with us Allie Marie, who is our, <clears throat> whose book happens to have some paranormal elements to it. And she is our paranormal attendee today. And this is a really interesting one uh, set during the very early 20th century down in Portsmouth, Virginia. And I should have said that Eleanor's book is uh, set in 1815 in the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia. It's actually 1800. Excuse me. 1800. Sorry. Pardon me, because 1815 is... <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> Catherine Shellman, who has Silence in the Library, which is a, a very um, Agatha Christie-esque sort of uh, fast-paced novel set in London, which is, of course, after my own heart, since that's where my novels are set as well. So I'd, I'd like to start off by uh, asking sort of a group question, and I don't want to say it's a rapid-fire one, but just briefly, if you could each describe for me, sort of give me the 30, give the audience the 30 second elevator speech of what your book or what your series is, and then do a description of your lead character. And I want to start with Eleanor. Uh, uh, my main character, uh, Will Reese, is a traveling weaver. Uh, there's no weaving in Death in the Great Dismal. He and Lydia are asked to go down to the Great Dismal Swamp to rescue an enslaved woman. Uh, many of the enslaved uh, ran to the Great Dismal for refuge. Mm -hmm. uh, Will, this is the 10th book and Will is a amateur detective who is very curious, obviously, and occasionally travels around to different, different locales. And this, this was my favorite one. I can see why, and, and the audience will see why too once we start digging a little deeper into that book. Okay, um, Ali Marie. Okay, basically, mine starts out with a small wooden box full of trinkets and a tear-stained journal. And what happened is two modern day characters have each found artifacts that belong to their great-grandparents. And it brings them to Portsmouth on the search because the modern character Marcus is the grandson of a German sailor named Tobias Palmer. Tobias had English father and a German mother. He was on the ship that was interned at the Portsmouth Navy Yard just before World War I. This was a marauding ship that um, sailed along the Atlantic coast and they could not make it back to Germany. So they snuck into Virginia past 
right past the noses of the British and the French. And that's what brought them there. So Tobias and Addy were the 19th, uh, the early 20th century characters and Marcus and Heidi are their descendants that are trying to solve the mystery and help them find peace. Very good, yep. And Catherine. Uh, well, like you said, uh, I mean, it's a historical mystery, Silence in the Library. Uh, it's part of the Lily Adler Mysteries, which are sort of cozy historical whodunits um, set in Regency London, so 1815. The main character is Lily Adler, who's a young widow. Um, her husband died very unexpectedly and the books sort of follow her as she's trying to put her life back together. And one of the things that keeps happening as she does that is she keeps ending up in the middle of murder mysteries. Uh, so this one, um, they're kind of like, if you take like a, like a BBC costume drama, but instead of focusing on marriage, you're focusing on murder. Uh, so this, <laughs> <laughs> this one is, uh, she uh, ends up in the middle of an investigation into the death of a friend of her father's. And that one is made more complicated by the fact that she has a very rocky relationship with her father. So there's the murder mystery plus the family drama, plus, you know, Lily's journey through her, her grief and building her life um, once again. So I, I have to, I want to tell the audience that I have read all three of these books and I did not guess the ending for any of the three of them. Oh. All three of them have very unique just approaches to their time period. All three of them have very unique, I've never read before sorts of elements to their books. So that um, even though we're talking about all historicals here, they're all vastly, vastly different and highly recommend reading them. And so let me throw out to the audience and you can just do this in chat. Have you read any of the author's books? If so, whose books have you read so far? Let's see a let's see a running list going on in chat of who's read what. And meanwhile, I want to ask a couple of um, personalized questions to you all. And I want to start with Catherine. So your heroine Lily is uh, moving about. And also, I have to say, I find it funny that your heroine is Lily and mine is Violet. And we just love these flower names. We just love these flower names when we're talking historically, don't we? So she's moving about Regency London society and she's solving murders. And she's got this disapproving eye of a Bow Street runner who doesn't, who's not very happy uh, with her involvement in things, uh, which I find uh, very humorous. But she, in this book, she encounters a boy who's got a condition that today we would understand as being autism. We, we you know, I'm immediately recognizing this in the book, but of course, back then, that would not be true. That would not be a diagnosed thing. Yet I think your book very skillfully handles attitudes and things, the various attitudes that there would have been toward that. And so I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, your research on the condition and historically how it was viewed and how would it have been treated? And I mean, treated medically and treated by society uh, in, in your time frame. Excuse me. Um, well, I'm very lucky that I, there are historians out there doing very deep dive research into the primary sources that give you that information. And I can read their books <laughs> to do my research, which is goes a lot faster than trying to dig through the primary sources yourself. Um, so there's a list of those particular researchers in the back of the book, if anyone's interested in that. Um, but what a lot of them have found is that, like you said, these conditions, you know, it's not like they're new. People have had um, neurological or neuroatypical or neurodivergent, th th those sort of, those people have been around for forever. Neurodivergent people have always existed. There just wasn't a name for it or there wasn't that particular label or people didn't know that, oh, this set of behavior and this set of behavior, they're actually related to the, the same cause. Um, so in sort of going through historical records, the way you find them is essentially by the behavior patterns that are recorded. And there's actually a, a fair number of those. Um, there's a little more available in the late 1800s. That's when a lot of um, people were starting to create schools where people who were what we would today consider neuro neurodivergent or had, you know, sort of, if they had autism spectrum disorder or if they had sensory processing disorders or things along, uh, like along those lines, there were specialized schools that families could send their kids to. Those didn't exist so much in the period that I'm writing in, um, but the people were around still. And what you find is that um, 
you know, like a lot of things, how you were, how you were treated, how you were raised, what resources were available to you really depended on how much money your family had. Um, people who, whose families had very few resources, if they could care for them at home, they would, and they would just be part of family life and social life to the extent that they, they could. If they were considered, um, you know, dangerous, I feel terrible saying that, but that was a way they were taught that people were talked about or written about a lot, um, then they might've been sent to an asylum or an institution. And those places were really not, not safe, not healthy, not actually focused on, on helping people. They were essentially just keeping people there. Um, so that was a, a really unfortunate, uh, sort of fate, I guess, of a lot of uh, people who are neurodivergent, but came from less wealthy families who maybe didn't have the resources to care for them at home. Wealthier, children of wealthier families honestly lived with their, their families a lot um, into their adulthood. If their families could care for them, they would hire specialized servants. And depending on sort of how their be what parts of their behavior was affected, there's a lot of people, you know, today who are neurodivergent and are out in the world doing their thing and you don't know until they they tell you um, and that was the case then too but if they were maybe less able to function according to what was expected socially then um, they would be they would be kept at home and maybe not not really known about um, outside of their family circle but you know like most like most things a lot of sort of what happened to you if you were not mm -hmm. sort of the most the most typical person um was really dependent on the resources that your family had. And, and that makes sense. Even my grandmother back in the 1940s in America, um, I guess she had had some episodes and she was under constant threat of being put away where society couldn't see her. So, you know, it, it, clearly there's a long history of those kinds of things. And, and, you know, things have clearly changed a lot in society today. Allie, let's, let's move to you. Your book features uh, paranormal themes within sort of this romance that spans more than a, a century across more than one couple. <laughs> and in, more, more interestingly, uh, your book focuses on the internment of a German warship in Virginia prior to the start of World War II. I had never heard of this before. And I live in Maryland. I should have heard of it before. Uh, can you tell our audience a little bit uh, about this, the real story behind this German cruise ship turned warship. Okay, I actually did not know about it either, Christine. The uh, there's a German restaurant here in well in Portsmouth that when I spoke with the owner there, she asked me if I had known about the German village that used to exist in Portsmouth in the early 1900s, and I had never heard about it. So I started digging deeper into it and. Of course, one thing led to another, and it read, led me down that rabbit hole of finding out more. This little German village was created by the sailors who were interned. And as I alluded to a little earlier, what had happened was this uh, very beautiful cruise ship had turned into a warship when the Germans were kind of marauding the seas and trying. This was before World War I, and this was around 1915 and 1916 when they were up and down the coast off the Atlantic waters. And they were pretty prolific down in the South American waters where they attacked ships. They didn't kill anybody, but you know they took the goods, they sank the ships, they sank one American ship. And they had been several years away from Germany. And as they were trying to make their way back to Germany for much needed repairs, they knew they could not cross the Atlantic Ocean in the condition they were in and fight off the British and the French navies with whom they were at war. America was neutral, was not in the war, and under the, the laws of the maritime and war era, they were allowed to seek refuge in neutral waters. So during the night, the, the first ship, which is actually the crown, I mean, the Prince Eitel Frederick, and I don't know if my pronunciation is anywhere near accurate, sailed into the waters first they first went to Newport News right under the noses of the Brits and the, the um, French navies and America woke up to a German ship in their port. Well, mm -hmm. the repairs would take more than the two weeks they would have allowed to stay in port under the safety of the neutral government. And they had to agree to be interned and they were taken to the 
Portsmouth Norfolk Navy Yard. And that was where the repairs were gonna be conducted, but they still couldn't get them done. And they, they were interned for two years right there. And they were allowed to build this little German village on the shipyard. And um, once America entered the war, they became true prisoners of war. And then the ship was confiscated and the, the sailors were taken as prisoner. But for those two years, they lived a relatively free life, even though they were interned, they couldn't go home. They were allowed to leave the ship. They were taken to baseball games in America, um, in Portsmouth and Norfolk. They went to the old Ocean View Park. They had pretty much were guests and they were honored kind of rock stars. And everybody from New York down to the Carolinas would come and take pictures of them. And they uh, paid 10 cents to get into the little German village and their, um, their little farmer's market. They actually had a couple of acres of land they built the, the windmill, all of these intriguing things that nobody ever knew about because the, the little village had to be destroyed to make room for a dry dock when America entered the war. But I had old pictures. I had tremendous assistance from the shipyard historians. They gave me access to pictures. Some of the postcards are used on the cover, which, Christine, if you can hold that up, I know that's not terribly visible, but a lot of the artifacts from the treasure box and the postcards are real postcards from that era that had been sent out. And um, then the little trinkets that there was a German, their equivalent of a penny was a fennig. And it was traditional to change the coins with your boyfriend and girlfriend. So the German boy gave the American girl that he met in Portsmouth a 1915 German fennig. And she gave him, I think that was the year I used, and um, she gave an American penny. And those were in the artifacts that they're their grandchildren eventually found and had to come back to try to, they were not allowed to, to marry the, the, um, the German boy and the American girl. And they had a lot of heartache and tragedy and they were trying to run off to get married and more tragedy occurred. So um, that became the story, but that village and the, the ships not so much because that was a horrible part of the research, the very dry, statistics of the ship and the length and the, the metals that they were used and the boiler room sizes and stuff. Just for me to find one, one scene that, or one specific thing, that was a very dry, tedious part of the history, but the actual villages and the, the history with that was quite fun to research. Wonderful, thank you so much. And, and yeah, I actually went out and found some of the pictures out online, um, the, the, the Idle Wilhelm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right either. <laughs> Uh, it, well, Idle Wilhelm was the name yeah. of the village that combined the two ships. There were two ships that were in turn. One yeah. was the Crown Prince Wilhelm, and the other was the Prince Eitel Frederick. So the, the sailors took the combination of the ship's name to name the little German village at the shipyard, the Eitel Wilhelm. Got you. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> there was a, there was quite a bit of German in the book. So thank goodness I had a, a, a little getting that a little mixed up. My former daughter-in-law was very instrumental in helping me stay straight with that. You just can't Google a translation. Yeah, right, right. All right, Eleanor, let's talk about Death and the Great Dismal. Your book has one of the really most dramatic uses of setting as character that I've seen. I must admit, uh, I... I had heard of the Great Dismal Swamp. I knew nothing about it, absolutely nothing about it. And, you know, the fact that there's this story of slaves that hid there uh, during the early part of the 19th century, I knew nothing about that. And that that's always neat when you, and I'm sure a lot of attendees would say the same thing, when you find a historical book that teaches you about something really that is unique to you. And, and, you know, you get to learn all this stuff while having fun along the way. That is just the mark of a really wonderful book. So I was wondering, you know, could you talk a little bit about the Great Dismal Swamp and the story of the slaves that were hiding in there? Did you actually go to the Great Dismal Swamp? Because it does not sound like a place I would ever want to set foot in. <laughs> and, um, you know, how accurate are the descriptions you're making regarding, you know, the, the things that eat you? Um, and other wildlife in the swamp? Well, um, yes, I have been to the Great Dismal Swamp, and I actually found out about it from Katie Kelly. I was down for um, one of the Suffolk Mystery Festivals, mm -hmm. and she mentioned it, and we went. My husband and I drove through the swamp, 
which is probably one of the most alien environments you can find in this er in the area. And I went back and I bought this book. This uh, it is a book from uh, an archeologist who actually did digs in the Great Dismal Swamp and discovered uh, not so many artifacts because the swamp eats everything really, but uh, the remains of villages and uh, where the, they had built their wooden huts and all of that. And I bought this and that, that was the beginning. This was the beginning. And uh, then I started researching it in depth. Uh, yes, the uh, many, 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 many thousands of fugitives fled to the swamp. They built uh, villages on, unusually under the pines because those were like little oases, a little bit above the water level. And it, it is an incredibly dangerous place to be. I went back, we went back several times. I think I've been there five times now and took tours. And on one of them, the tour guide took a 12 foot stick and put it into the peat and the stick disappeared without a trace. They don't know how deep that peat swamp is. So if you're wandering around the swamp, you could, you could literally lose your life and disappear and nobody would ever know where you were. And that's still true, even though the swamp is about 100,000 acres as opposed to the much, much larger uh, area that it had when George Washington first saw it. The, all the descriptions, except for one, are accurate and pulled right from the primary sources. All the bugs are there. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, the tour guide tells you right at the outset, you better wear insect repellent because everything there wants to bite you. And even with insect repellent, they are banging against the window of the tour bus. They're banging against your glasses. They want to get at you in the worst way. I can only imagine what it was like to live there. Uh, the fugitives built little villages. They did farm on their little cleared patches. They did hunt whenever, whatever they could. There were slave catchers who used dogs and ran, went after them into the, the swamp and tried to catch them. All of that is accurate. The one thing that I put in that was not accurate was the story that uh, there was a group of fugitives fleeing to the swamp, being followed by slave catchers and dogs. And the slaves jumped into a, a body of water to escape. And the dogs jumped in after them and they were eaten by alligators. There are no alligators in the swamp. It is uh, too cold. It is still too cold, even though it's in Virginia and North Carolina. But everyone at that, at, at that point did believe that there were alligators and that they did save this group of people. Um, it's current, it's now a wildlife refuge uh, and it is full, it still has uh, cat, the big cats, it has bear, the big bears, deer, all of that. So um, I really recommend at least going into the swamp and walking around because it is, it is still a pretty hostile environment. And you can only imagine how desperate these people were to be free, that they were willing to go and live there. That, that, that you, you were willing to be drowned in peat, never to be seen again, or to have bugs eat you alive. Just reading the description of all the bugs landing on people, it, it, um, yeah. they may not ever want to visit the Great Dismal Swamp, not, not ever. <laughs> Um, so I want to say that people are, are uh, talking about books they've read, and it looks like um, people have read Eleanor's series, and, and people have read Allie Marie's, and from Miss Rochelle, we have, knowing the historical backgrounds, I'm looking to read both Allie's book and Catherine's. I've read all Christine's books, and I'm looking for Eleanor's series right now. Sounds awesome. Oh my goodness. Well, that's really great when we can have an attendee who's jumping out onto Amazon in the moment to buy our books, right? So anyway, that's really good to know. Again, I encourage people, if you have any questions you want to ask any or all of the authors, don't, don't hold your questions to the end. Go ahead and ask now. And if, if you ladies don't mind, we do have a question. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it before we move on. And this is from Grace Topping. And she wants to know, how do you keep modern terminology and outlooks from creeping into your books? 
Great question. Uh, let's start. Let's see. I ended with Eleanor. Let's start with Eleanor. Um, that, that's a very good question because I try to use a little bit of dialect to show the difference in speech. And New York, in New York City, there's a museum where you can listen to recordings of people speaking. You can hardly understand a word. You can barely understand it when it's written out. So I did it very lightly. But I did try to use some of the uh, more understandable slang that we <clears throat> used then. And I tried to uh, keep it as accurate as I could. But uh, I do have a beta reader who goes through, through it. So, um, and I think that's pretty critical because uh, I think no matter how carefully you research there, it's very easy to think you know something and put it in and it turns out you didn't know it at all. Mm -hmm. So it's, you have to have somebody to take a look at it. So Catherine, your, your book of course is, is focused in a setting where society, speech, everything is very structured, shall we say. So what, what is your challenge in keeping modern terminology and outlooks out? I think it's sort of it's sort of two part. I mean, one, I definitely agree. You have to have someone else look at it too. I have beta readers, and then I had a very very helpful editor who goes through everything and she'll flag words and say like, let's let's double check this one. And so we spend a lot of time, you know, like just full on in a dictionary looking for first recorded use of this word. Mm -hmm. Would people because usually you can guess someone would have been like conversationally people would have been using it maybe twenty years before there was a recorded use of something or maybe like five to 20 years sort of depending. Um, but you look for like, when was this actually being used? And sometimes you find like, oh, it was being used. People were writing it down in the, the 12th century. I'm fine. And sometimes you find like, oh, actually they might not have been using it until 50 years later. Can't put that in there. Um, so, you know, just a lot of, a lot of double checking. Um, in terms of research, I find that looking at letters that people wrote is a really great, great way of finding how, how people might have actually talked. Um, if you look at fiction written in the time, that doesn't really give you a sense of what real people would have spoken like, um, but things like uh, letters or court records, especially because they're just recording word for word what people were, were saying, um, they can give you a real sense of sort of the, especially for people of different classes, how they would have been speaking. Um, and then you just sort of do your best to approximate that on the page. Um, but I also do find it interesting always when I'm researching how many things, especially in terms of outlooks or like behavior that we think of as modern that are actually totally historically appropriate. Like you say, oh, uh, I heard about this uh, enclave of lesbians living in London who are all vegetarians. And you think like that has to be something modern, but no, there was one in 1888, right in the middle of London. Um, and you know, things like that, where you, you expect it to be a very modern construct or a very modern outlook or pattern of behavior. And it's, it's been around for, for much longer than you expect. You know, one of the, one of my favorite phrases for that is uh, the term hanging out, which we think of as a very, very modern way of describing people's behavior. But people were using that in the 18th century to describe rich young men spending all their time at coffee shops instead of doing something useful with their lives. So it just, there's a lot of stuff where you, you have to really let go of preconceptions about what, what is modern and what is historical? Because I think no matter which you think it is, you're going to be surprised. And, and I, I will say that I've found sometimes I've put something in a book and it's been historically accurate, but the editor will come back and say, well, it might be historically accurate, but it sounds too modern and readers may call yes. us out on it. So mm -hmm. you need to take it out. So, um, so sometimes we, we, have to, you know, follow those kind of dictates too. So Allie, what are your thoughts on keeping modern terminology and outlooks from <coughs> into your books? I think um, Eleanor and Catherine have both summed it up and you very well that it, um, it does take research and uh, Googling for when was the term such and such first used to at least get some sort of time frame where it was used or popular or first came into being or why it came into existence. So I found that it, you can sometimes spend a whole day when you are researching an era that's not your own. And for me, this particular book dealt mainly with early 20th century America 
and the modern day characters, plus the German aspects of it, which had to be, what were the names? What were the, the words that the Germans used for um, the, the, the jobs on the ship? Because they don't exist now, some of them, and it, it just took a lot of work to be accurate and I like to be accurate. So, but letters, like Catherine said, for me, I kind of get into the character of the person talking in the other, gen um, like this one's a hundred years apart. So for me, it was kind of easy to slip and just become that person and talk as I think that person would have talked and writing the letters, which is a great deal of how the correspondence, while the, the um, sailor and the local girl were not able to be together when he would, the, um, once they became prisoners of war and they had to correspond by letters to try to speak in that tone that would have been more prominent back then. And then even in my other books where the, the some of the um, correspondence comes from the 18th century, you know, I, I had to look at other sources of, of not trying to read old books or anything because that doesn't work, but actually reading old letters to see the, the cadence and the, the way that they talked. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, and again, any questions you have, jump in. We'll, we'll answer them as we go. Um, oh, and one just popped in. Wow, ask and you shall receive. Uh, so we'll go ahead and answer another audience question before I go to another question. All right, ladies. From Christina Sneering, Sneeringer. How much time does it take you initially to research before you start a new novel or a fresh series? I can answer that. Oh, because me, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't pick on somebody, did I? <laughs> let's, <laughs> Catherine, Catherine, let's start with you. Oh, I think it depends on whether you already have a deadline for the book or not. Um, if you have a <laughs> deadline, it goes much faster. <laughs> Deadlines are very motivating. <laughs> um, I would say, I think... A lot of times for me, as soon as I get an idea, I want to start reading about it and, and researching it. Um, so it's it can often be a really ongoing process. Um, I usually like to get a decent grip of the world before I start writing, start actually drafting the plot. Um, so that way I don't have to rewrite quite as much of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, I don't think it really stops. Um, you, I don't know if you all have the same experience. I find that basically up until the end, there's always something that I'm still looking up before I turn that final draft in. And it might not be that big, like, oh, I've got my stack of, of sources that I'm reading to get my, my big picture sense of what's going on, but like, oh, where was, what was this landmark called, you know, 200 years ago. I don't know. Did it have a different name? Did it have the same name? I've got to find a map and I've got to go online and spend half a day tracking down this one map that'll tell me the name of this one place so I can mm -hmm. get. So it's a lot of the detail research still keeps going. Um, but I think the the big picture stuff, how long I spend on it depends on whether there's a deadline or not. So Allie, what do you say to that? Well, I can give you a very good example in writing Return to Afton Square. I had an eight hours at the computer that day, I wrote 800 words of the story and the rest of the time was totally researching and getting the things to match up. For me, I don't, I have an idea where the story is going to go. So the plot is already forming. And sometimes I have to leave a blank chapter to come back and fill in with the research that I don't maybe want to do right then. But I, I know my characters have certain things that are going to happen. So I'll write that scene in that chapter or that activity and maybe highlight, check to find out the name of whatever so that I can get the momentum of the writing. Because if you get bogged down with your research, the shiny squirrels, as I call them, show up. It's not just the squirrels and not just shiny quarters. They're shiny squirrels because each time that you Google something, it leads you to something else. Oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, let me check my email real quick. So you have to stay away from that. And um, I'm finding that it's easier for me to kind of parallel. My story is plodding along and I'm leaving the spaces for what research. And if something is going to mess me up, then I have big, big gaps and say with the, the highlighting, uh, I'm doing that now with the new series My is The True Spirits. It's a spinoff of my first. The first book, which comes out next month, is, or no, in 10 days, 
is um, the brewer story. So I had to do a lot of research on the brewing technique at a brew house, not just home brewing. So I had like four remedial lessons to get the hang of that. The next one is a whiskey distiller. And I will actually be going to a distillery to learn the process to be able to give a layman's description in the book, not something to bore people or to make it so scientific that they're not interested or to make a brewer or a distiller out of somebody. It's just enough for the character to show off what their knowledge is to the person they're trying to invent. So that takes away from the writing. And you, uh, for me, I just have to kind of parallel the plotting and the research. Yep, and always a challenge not to try to be doing a tutorial. Eleanor, do you have? Um, it the my first book, uh, the Simple Murder. It took me two years to to do all the research, visit the Shakers, f get everything together. Um, I know Reese's world now, so it takes me probably six months to put everything together. But I I agree with Catherine. I start with a kind of a big picture thing to make sure that the idea I have is possible. And then from then, our, then on, it's like concentric circles. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until then you're down to individual words and researching every little piece that goes in. It doesn't stop. You, you do your first draft and you're still researching all the, the way through. Mm -hmm. We have another question from the floor. And that is, how do you organize your research? So uh, let's start with um, Allie. Let's start with you. Okay, I, I think I finally pinpointed the way my research is going to work the best for me because I tend to jot down on notebooks and I don't always have the same notebook with me or I will um, print out something that I want to follow up on later. And sometimes those files don't get into the same pile, but I have been using index cards, color-coded index cards that I found are, have worked very well for the particular book that is just coming out. And I can narrow it down, bullet point it, and then find what I need in the full research. And that's working very well for me this time because I have my characters under one color and the, um, the, the plot under another color and the secondary characters under the third. And I forgot what my fourth color, I'd have to look on my wall and I make a strategy board out of it. And that's because these, my books are intertwined and my next two books, things that happen in the first book are going to affect what happens in book two and book three. So I have to stay accurate and on track so that when I'm going to the next book, I'm already locked into what happened in the first book. And I can't change from that. So it, it, it's very important to keep that all organized. And the research is a big part of it so that I'm not inaccurately referring to something that I had described differently in the first book. Sure, so Eleanor, is your research different or similar? Well, I do use a notebook, but I use a notebook for every, a, a separate notebook for every book. Uh, so I have uh, sections in the notebook is uh, dedicated to uh, notes that I've jotted down, various kinds of research things, ideas for the plot. Um, when I'm working on uh, the Will Reese series, I, I have my two main characters, but any other ancillary characters. But I'm, I'm not as organized as Ali Marie. I mean, a lot of my research books look like this. You see all the the tags, this is all things that I wanna remember. And all my research books look like that, where uh, all the things I wanna remember are in those books. And um, and then I jot on the little tags what, what the subject is that that uh, refers to. So it works for me. Um, it's probably the, the index cards and all of that probably is a lot more efficient, um, but this, this does work for me. Everybody has their own system. And Catherine, what's your system? Oh, it's not a great one. <laughs> my it's first not thought when I saw that question <laughs> pop, up, pop up was, how do I organize my research? Poorly, very poorly. <laughs> um, it's, it's very all over the place. It really depends on what type of sources I'm working with. If it's something that I found online that I know I want to keep track of and come back to, I'll either bookmark it. I have um, a bookmark folder for each, each series that I work on. Um, 
So I'll save it there or I'll, I'll save it to Pinterest just so I have a board for each, each book that has uh, specific references that I want to keep track of. I also have lots of research books on shelves with little notes tacked in them. I'll, I'll keep a running like sort of list, um, in a separate document of stuff that I know I want to put in an author's note if I want to reference a certain researcher or some or a book that I read. Um, I'll jot down notes in a in a text document just so I have them in one place. It's it's very unorganized, um, but it all it all just kind of floats around in my brain. I really want to start using Scrivener, which is a writing program that I know a lot of writers love and I started using it and then my computer died and I never downloaded it onto the new computer. So that's on me, but I've heard it's very good for organizing your research. And so that is how I organize. I use Scrivener. I write in Scrivener. I organize in Scrivener, research, settings, everything. I put everything into one place because then you're looking at it all in one place. That's right. smart. So we have about nine minutes left to be precise. And we do have one other interesting question out here. Oh, somebody has made the comment that Trello also has charts for free. Yes, that, uh, whoever said that, that's a software I've downloaded like Catherine, and, and, and but then I've never used it. But I think Trello helps you organize projects and it, it's free online software. So something you might wanna consider downloading. So we're down to about the last nine minutes. I see another question I'd like to have uh, if I could get you all to answer it fairly quickly, because then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what's next on your plate and what readers can look forward to next. So let me ask this question, which is, um, how do you find beta readers who are familiar enough with your era to provide good feedback? So let's, uh, Catherine, let's start with you. Uh -huh. It's probably not a very helpful answer for this question. I, none of the beta readers that I that I swap with regularly are particularly familiar with my era outside of my own writing. Um, but I actually find that it's that that is its own kind of helpful um, because they often flag things that they'll say was this this feels too modern to me or this feels a little weird um, because they don't have that historical context. So even that sometimes calls to calls my attention to things that I hadn't noticed and do need to adjust, or um, it lets me know that, oh, this is historically accurate, but maybe it doesn't feel that way to readers who don't know the time period as well. So like you were saying, Christine, like maybe this needs to be, to be changed just so it doesn't take people out of the story. Um, so I think you don't necessarily, I find that I don't necessarily need beta readers who are so deeply familiar with, with my time period. Um, I think that would be its own kind of helpful, but I think the other way is helpful also. Okay, great. Eleanor. How, what, uh, I, I can what say exactly what, what, Chris, what uh, Catherine said. Uh, my beta readers are not that familiar with, the, with that era. Uh, they tend to flag holes in the plot or um, I would, I'll say like one of the ones, oh, uh, he was riding a horse. And, oh, and then he ran and jumped in the wagon. Well, he wasn't using the wagon, he was riding a horse. So that kind of thing. And um, I do think it's useful to have, uh, like Catherine said, you, that to have someone who's not that familiar because I think we've all had the experience of doing research and putting in things that are historically accurate and having blowback on them. I've had it a number of times because people think that they know the history and what are you, you doing? So if I think there might be a problem or one of my beta readers says, but this, this is an anachronism, I put it in an author's note if I really want to use it so that I can explain that this was historically accurate and it was in a document or whatever, I, uh, I, wherever I found it. Okay, great. And Allie, any final thoughts Thanks. about finding beta readers? Same for me, I because I don't only write in one era, I've covered from the um, colonial period, a little bit in the Civil War era, and of course the early 20th century and the modern times. So there is no one era in my writing. And the readers are just like Catherine and Eleanor said, they're, they're looking, if they question something, then I verify it, or maybe I need to change the wording to make it not Somebody, if, if they ask, if they have a question with it, then a reader is going to have a question with it. Maybe sometimes it's just a matter of tweaking the words and the, the thought is still there or the historical value is still there. 
but by them not being familiar, that exact question comes up of, did they say that back in that day? Or did they do that? Or would a child of that age actually speak that well or whatever? And that, that makes it easier to tweak. Great. Okay, well, we've got just a few minutes left. So this is our lightning round on questions. <laughs> and so the question I have for each of you is to talk about what's next. What are you working on next? What are you dreaming about working on? What might you be working on in five years? Um, I'll give you each say a minute uh, to talk about what projects are coming up so, so we can get everybody excited and start you know, pre-ordering your books and, and all that kind of thing. So let's start with Eleanor. Uh, I have um, actually two new Reese, Will Reese books. I wrote Murder on uh, Principle, which is basically a sequel to Death in the Great Dismal, where uh, the slave owner pursues Reese and Lydia and the fugitives to Maine. And of course, all kinds of havoc ensues. Uh, the one after that, uh, Reese and Lydia go to Boston. But my, I'm working on now a totally different series that takes place in Bronze Age Crete. That, wow, that is way different. And do you have any anticipated? Well, the first one is already out with uh, my agent and Good. I'm working on the second one. So it is, and it's a lot harder to research because there's no newspapers, no, you know, basically no written word. And uh, the myths are, refracted through the lens of, you know, the Hellen Hellenistic Greece. So they're not completely the way the Minoans thought. And yeah, it's been challenging. I bet. All right, <laughs> Allie, in about a minute, what have you got coming up for everybody? Okay, my um, spinoff series from my original series, spirit, uh, series, The True Colors, which was colonial based in the old history with modern characters in Old Town Portsmouth solving the mysteries. Return to Afton Square was a bridge between that series and my spinoff, which is The True Spirits, which has to do with the brewing, distilling, and the wine connoisseur, as well as the spirits that occupy the building. So I have two kinds of spirits in that. I'm in three anthologies that will be coming out within the next year. And in 2023, I plan on starting a series that will take place more into the Isle of Wight, Suffolk and Smithfield area of Virginia and capitalizing on the history that's there. At least that's what I think. Plus I still have my police procedurals as a retired officer. That was always my intent to write and I haven't really gotten to them yet. So I have thriller, thrillers and things on my mind to squeeze out in between. Well, you are busy too. Catherine, tell us what you've got coming up. What can we look forward to from you? I have two books coming out this summer. Um, in June will be Last Call at the Nightingale, which is a uh, slightly grittier, more glamorous uh, mystery set in 1920s New York City. Um, so that'll be coming out in June. And then in August will be the third Lily Adler mystery. Um, so that's one's uh, a little more a little more gothic and a little more dramatic, kind of a little bit of a vibe change from the first two, which was fun to write. Um, and then there will be follow-ups to both of those coming out in 2023. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I too am working on the next in the uh, Lady of Ashes series that I hope will be out next year. And I am working with some other authors on another anthology for whatever that's worth. Um, well, anyway, I wanted to thank everybody for being here, for joining us. I hope you found this very informative and entertaining. I hope you, uh, you can visit if you, um, uh, go to the, the Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival website. You can find websites for everybody and learn more about the authors than you've heard today. I hope you'll go out to Amazon and collect your favorite books. Um, I hope you'll buy everything from every author. Uh, whether you like to read in E or paper or however you, however you like your books, I hope that you'll consider some new reads here. Uh, Katie, thank you for helping us with putting on this session. We're very appreciative to have been here today. An absolute joy. Enjoyed meeting everybody online and can't wait to meet everybody hopefully next year in person because I'm a huggy person. I need to hug people. <laughs> so anyway, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Katie. Thank you.